Hey everybody, it's Mr. Bortnick for AP Calculus AB. We are in Unit 3, Differentiation, Composite, Implicit, and Inverse Functions. Today's topic is 3.2, which we're talking about implicit differentiation. Enjoy today's notes. All right, welcome to Section 3.2 on Implicit Differentiation. Last section, we learned about the chain rule. Now we're going to figure out how to do it to do some slightly more complicated problems. Now, the first thing we want to talk about is what is the difference between the word explicit and the word implicit? Um, we can have equations that are in both of those sort of scenarios, but an explicit equation is one where, you know, frequently I think about it as can you get the x by, can you get a, a variable by itself? So, can you get a variable by itself? If so, we would say that that equation is written explicitly. So an example of that would be something like, you know, if we had like y equals 3x plus 15, right? This is explicitly written. The y value is explicitly in terms of 3x plus 15. You know, we might have different variables. You might say, for example, like f of t is equal to, you know, negative 16t squared plus 34t minus 5. This is explicitly written. Even though it doesn't have a y in it, we were able to get, you know, the output was exactly equal to uh, some things that involved the input. And so this would be another example of an explicit function. You know, we could use trig functions, we could use natural log functions. Functions, all of those would be explicit equations in this case. Now, what's an implicit equation? These are ones where, you know, maybe it's tougher to get the x or the y by itself. So, for example, you know, the equation of a circle. How about x squared minus y squared is equal to 25? You might remember that this is like a circle with radius 5, right? A uh, circle with radius 5. If we talked about that last year in honors algebra two or in pre-calculus, uh, that that you know that 25 is actually the radius squared, so circle with radius five would be would be that case. Now, of course, we could subtract x squared to the other side. We could take the square root, and we could write this as an explicit equation. But as this is currently written, this is an implicit equation. We could even have more complicated ones, right? I could have something like, say, 3x squared plus 2xy minus 5y squared is equal to 47. This is one where it would be incredibly hard to get an x or a y by itself because of this term here that has a both x and a y in it. Wow. Never seen equations like that before. Um, but, you know, relations or, you know, functions, depending upon how it is, might be written in this way implicitly, meaning that, you know, we can plug in varying values of x and y to give us sort of this output, and they actually give us some interesting shapes, like this one up here, which we said was a circle. So, again, Explicit equations are ones where we've got, you know, the y, for example, by itself. We've really been focusing on derivative rules for explicit equations up until this point. Today we're going to expand to try to figure out how do we use these rules that we learned for explicit equations in these weirder implicit equation situations where there's x's and y's. In order to do that, we're going to think back to what our chain rule says and some of these derivative rules that we know. Now, we know that the derivative of x uh, with respect to x is 1. And part of the reason why we know that, even though we don't explicitly talk about it, is it's the derivative of the x with respect to x. It's almost like we're actually dividing two things that are exactly the same, and that sort of gives us an idea of why that would be 1 here. Um, but in this case, what we've got, you know, if we think about this in terms of y... What is this saying? This is saying take the derivative with respect to x of the function y. Because these two variables do not match, because these fun the variables do not match, this nice little canceling that we had over here does not actually occur. And what we technically have is like we've got this function that is in terms of y, even though we're doing it with respect to x, it's almost like its own little chain rule problem. So we know that the derivative of y is going to be just 1, right? Same as the derivative of x is. But we don't know what, what the, in, the derivative of the inside is. So when we do that, we end up with this 1 times the dy over dx, the derivative of whatever y is with respect to x. And so if I ever take the derivative of just y, that is dy dx, the derivative of y with respect to x. And this is different, again, from this scenario. These two scenarios are different here because 
In this case, our two variables matched. And so we don't have like, this extra sort of term. It's just the number one if we take that derivative. Here, because these derivatives, uh, these variables did not match, we ended up with this dy dx term. Okay, well, let's take a look at the second one. Well, we all know that the derivative of x squared, if we use the power rule, is simply 2x. How is that different here where these variables do not match? Derivative of x, or the derivative of y squared with respect to x, well, we still take the derivative of y squared using the power rule. That's still 2y. But because those variables don't match, we end up multiplying this dy dx term. So while this was just 2x, over here it's 2y times the derivative of y with respect to x. Interesting. Third, sort of like a chain rule problem over here, right? This 5x is inside of that uh, e, e to the x function. So by the chain rule, if we do that, this derivative is going to be uh, e to the 5x. So that's the derivative of the outside with the inside plugged in times the derivative of the inside, which is 5. So 5e to the 5x would be the derivative of that function. And that's also the case over here where these variables do not match. It's also the case. It's going to be uh, e to the 5y times 5. But again, because those variables don't match, we end up with this dy dx term at the end. So what's your takeaway here? So I would think about, you know, if the variables match like what we've been doing so far, if they're all x's, we use our regular rules, we don't worry about anything else. In cases where the variables don't match, sometimes they might be x's and y's, we might have t's, we might have something else. If they don't match, you're going to end up with these extra terms that we don't normally end up with. Uh, it is important to be pay paying attention to whether those variables match to see whether or not those terms need to be there. But in short, if I'm taking the derivative of something with a y in it, but I'm taking it with respect to x, it ends up with this extra dy dx term in each of those. Now, the good news is, uh, even though these problems are a little bit you know, tougher, they almost always follow the exact same four-step format. So we're going to do one together, and then you know, we'll do the other two together afterwards, but you know, maybe you'll consider pausing and trying to do those on your own. So find dy dx for y squared minus 5x cubed is equal to 3y. Right? We have this implicit function. Right? It would be tough to get either the x by itself or the y by itself, or certainly right now it's just not written that way. So we're going to use this four-step process to do it. First, take the derivative. Each time the derivative y is involved, if we're taking the derivative of something with a y in it, you need to have a dy dx next to it. Right? That was sort of our takeaway from up here, what we saw. So the derivative of y squared, right? this first part, this derivative of y squared is going to be 2y. But because there's a y, and we're taking this with respect to x, uh, this is going to be 2y dy dx. So it has that extra term. Our next term is a negative 5x cubed. right? That's in terms of x. We're taking the derivative with respect to x. We just use our regular power rule. That's going to be minus 15x squared. That's equal to the derivative of 3y. So the derivative of 3y is 3. But again, we need to multiply by the derivative of y, which is that dy dx. So again, in both places where I took the derivative of the y part, you notice that there's a dy dx in both of those. This didn't have a y, so it doesn't have that, uh, that extra term. Great. We're done with the calculus part. Step one is the only calculus part in this. The rest of this, step two through step four, is simply algebra. This is all algebra trying to get to the final answer. We've done all the calculus already. So what do we do for our next step? Well, the goal is we're trying to get dy dx by itself, right? But I noticed that there are two of them, right? They're, and they're on opposite sides of the equation. So what I need to do first is I need to get just the dy dx terms on the left side. Everything else is going to go on the right side. So what I'm going to do uh, is I'm going to, I'll show, simply show the work here. I'm going to subtract 3 dy dx on both sides, so minus 3 dy dx. And then I'm going to add 15x squared to both sides. What does that give us? Well, if we do that, that's going to be 2y dy dx minus 3 dy dx is equal to 15x squared. So all of the terms that had dy dx are now on the left side, and anything that doesn't have a dy dx is on the right side. Now the whole reason why we're doing this is now that everything that has dy dx is on the left, we can actually factor dy dx out of both of those terms. So this is going to be dy dx times 2y minus 3, and that's going to be equal to 15x squared. 
Now, because we factored it out, there's only one dy dx. And that means if I wanna get this dy dx by itself, since this is being multiplied, all we need to do is divide by 2y minus three on both sides to find out that dy dx is equal to 15x squared over 2y minus three. And that's gonna be our answer for uh, this example problem. Now, what did we just find? We found that for this implicit function, y squared minus 5x cubed is equal to 3y, if I want to find the derivative, aka the slope of the tangent line, at a given point, I would need to plug in the x value and the y value to find the slope, aka the derivative at that particular point. So 15x squared divided by 2y minus 3, that is the derivative function for this implicit uh, problem up here. All right. Let's keep going. So we've got some ones. Uh, I'd encourage you if you'd like to uh, pause this and try these using this same four step process that we did above, but I'm gonna go through these uh, you know, as examples as well if you wanna follow along as notes. All right, so step one, we take the derivative. So our derivative here is going to be three y squared. Because it's got a y, we're gonna have this dy dx term next to it. Minus the derivative of two x, which is just two, the derivative of x to the fourth is 4x cubed. And then the derivative of 2y is 2 times dy dx. Again, both of the terms that had y's in it when we took the derivative had those dy dx's. Step two, we want to get only the terms of the dy dx on the left. So that is going to be 3y squared dy dx. I'm going to subtract that 2 dy dx over. And that's equal to 4x cubed. And then I'm going to actually add this 2 over to the other side because it does not have a dy dx on it. Now that the, all the dy dx terms are on the left, I'm ready to move on to step three, which is to factor that dy dx out. So this is dy dx times 3y squared minus two, and that's equal to 4x cubed plus two. Step four, final step, now that there's just one dy dx left, we're gonna divide by that 3y squared. So dy dx is equal to 4x cubed plus two, all divided by 3y squared minus two. Again, this would be our derivative function for this implicitly defined relation that we've got up here. Nice, that's our derivative function or equation for this. Let's try number two. Hey, we can do this with uh, trig functions as well. Interesting. Okay, well, interestingly enough, uh, let's, let's t evaluate and see what we've got here. I actually notice that there's a function inside, right? So this is telling me that I'm gonna actually have to apply the chain rule because I have a function inside of another function. But not only that, I have x times y, which is telling me I'm gonna need the product rule at some point as well. So. In these implicitly defined equations, um, at taking those derivatives, frequently some of these like you know, chain rule things come up, product rule things come up, S very rarely quotient rule things. I would say almost most often I see product rule uh, is sort of like the next level of difficulty in these implicitly defined uh, functions for taking those derivatives. So how do we take that derivative? Well, the derivative of sine, that's our outside function, is cosine. The inside stays the same, so that's times xy. Through the chain rule then, we know we need to multiply by the derivative of the inside. But because this is a function times a function, we're gonna apply the product rule to it. So times the derivative of x is one. So one times y plus x times the derivative of y, which is dy dx. And that's gonna be equal to the derivative of 10x, which is just 10. Nice. Well, so this one only has one dy dx in it, right? I don't have to really do all of the steps as we did before. We just need to do algebra to get this dy dx by itself. So first I'm gonna divide by cosine of xy on both sides. So we get uh, one times y, which is just y, plus x dy dx is equal to uh, 10 divided by cosine of xy. You know, one way that we could write this also since we know that one over cosine is secant, one over cosine of x is the same thing as secant of x. Uh, you know, if thinking about, you know, maybe ways that we could rewrite this for like multiple choice answers, this would be the same thing as y plus x dy dx uh, is equal to 10 times the secant of xy, right? Because again, secant is one over cosine. So 
This over cosine of xy is the same thing as secant of xy, the 10 in the front. I'm going to subtract y from both sides. So x dy dx is equal to 10 secant xy minus y. And then to get that dy dx, we're going to divide by x on both sides. So dy dx is equal to 10 secant of xy minus y all over x. This would be our derivative function for this implicitly defined relation that we've got here. All right, number three, derivative at a point, uh, doing some implicit differentiation here. The question says, find the equation of all tangent lines, all tangent lines, and find the equation of all tangent lines for x squared plus y squared is equal to four when x is equal to one. So x squared plus y squared is equal to four is a circle which is why we've got this right here. And specifically, it's a circle with radius two, which we notice that makes sense. Looks like it's got two uh, as the radius for that. Um, so we wanna find the equation of all tangent lines when x is equal to one. What are we trying to find here? Well, when x is one, we're about right here or right here. Our tangent lines would look something like this. So we'd have like, that would be our tangent line. That's one tangent line. Our other tangent line would maybe look something like that. So those are going to be our two tangent lines. And, and immediately thinking about this graph, I recognize that there are going to be two answers, right? There's one, you know, we're going to have the first one, we're going to have the second one. We're going to need two different tangent lines for this. I also want to remind you from back in chapter two that we know that when we're writing the equation of a line in this class, we use point slope form. So point slope form, which is that y minus y1 is equal to m times x minus x1. That is a key, key thing for us to be using in this class anytime we want to write the equation of a line, because all we need is a point and a slope. So my question first is, uh, we can find the slope here in a bit, but I want to find the points first. I have the x value, but we know we need both the x and the y if we're gonna write the equation of a line. So since they didn't tell us the y value, I'm gonna plug that one into this original equation to find out what y values make this true. So we have x squared, so aka one squared plus y squared is equal to four. One plus y squared is equal to four. If we subtract one from both sides, we see that y squared is equal to three which means that y is equal to plus or minus the square root of three. So I have two coordinates. The first coordinate is one comma positive square root of three, and the other one is one comma negative square root of three. So I know both of those coordinates uh, from that work that we just did. All right, halfway there, I know the point. Now I need the slope to use this point slope form. So how do we find the slope? Well, we know that the slope is, uh, can be found, or the slope of the tangent line is the derivative. So if I had the original function, which was x squared plus y squared is equal to four, let's take the derivative of this with respect to x. So the derivative with respect to x of both sides of this equation. The derivative with respect to x of x squared is two x. The derivative of y squared is 2y times dy dx because those variables do not match, right? That y and that x. And then that's equal to the derivative of 4. That's a constant, so that's just 0. Let's get this dy dx by itself. So 2y times dy dx is equal to negative 2x. And that means that dy dx is equal to negative 2x divided by 2y or negative x over y. So if I want to find the, the slope or the derivative, the slope of the tangent line, I need to plug in the x and the y into this equation. So let's do that. Our first point, so at uh, one comma the square root of three, the derivative dy dx is gonna be equal to negative one over the square root of three. So negative one over the square root of three. Um, I don't particularly like leaving, uh, you know, numbers with uh, square roots in the denominator, so I'm going to just rationalize here real quick. Uh, this is going to be equal to negative square root of 3 over 3. That is our slope at uh, 1 comma square root of 3. Similarly, we want to find the slope at 1 comma negative square root of 3. And our, again, our equation was dy dx is equal to negative x over y. So that is going to be negative 1 over negative square root of 3. Those negatives cancel each other out. So that's going to give me 1 over the square root of 3 or 
root 3 over 3. So at 1 comma negative 3, or negative square root of 3, we get root 3 over 3 as that derivative. Does this make sense? Well, for this top function, we see that the slope of this line is negative, and we've got a negative slope. Here for our second tangent line, we see that the slope is positive, and in fact, we do have a positive slope. So at least, you know, that, that makes sense visually from what we can see. So what are these two equations? For our final answers for this, now that we've got the points and the slopes for both of these, here is going to be our equation. So y minus the y value, square root of 3, is equal to the slope, negative root 3 over 3, times x minus the x value, which is 1. This would be our answer for the first equation. And our second equation, y minus negative root 3 is the same thing as y plus the square root of 3, is equal to positive root 3 over 3 times x minus 1. That is our second equation. Those are going to be our two answers for this problem. Those are both of the equations of these two tangent lines for this circle. Very cool that we were able to do this with uh, the equation of a circle. We were able to find that derivative, find those slopes, but still use that good old point-slope form back from chapter 2. Great, that's number 3. We've got two more left, and really uh, we're going to just sort of tie this into horizontal and vertical tangent lines. A reminder... If it's a horizontal tangent line, horizontal means it's going straight across. Horizontal tangent lines exist when the slope is what? Well, if it's horizontal, that means the slope dy dx is zero. That makes a lot of sense. Vertical tangent lines exist when the slope is what? If we've got you know, a vertical tangent line, you know, if, if it's a vertical tangent line, the slope is certainly going to be undefined. Now, I want to mention that this is not always true. Uh, or rather, the, the converse is not always true. Just because it's undefined does not mean that it's a vertical tangent line. What the, the derivative might not be defined in places like where there's a cusp or a corner, um, but if we know that it's a vertical tangent line, we for sure know that the slope is going to be undefined. It's almost like an infinite slope going straight up for that. So how do we do this? Find all horizontal tangent lines of the graph 3x squared plus 2y squared is equal to 16. Okay, well, if we're finding horizontal tangent lines, we want to find places where the derivative is equal to zero. So I need to find dy dx, and so let's do some implicit differentiation for this equation. If we do that, that's going to be, you know, again, we're taking the derivative with respect to x of that 3x squared plus 2y squared is equal to 16. The derivative of 3x squared is 6x. The derivative of 2y squared is 4y times dy dx, because, again that y does not match the variable with which we're taking the derivative with respect to, and the derivative of 16 is 0. Let's get that dy dx by itself. 4y times dy dx is equal to negative 6x. That means that dy dx is equal to negative 6x over 4y, or negative 3x over 2y, if we simplify that. So we've got negative 3x over 2y, and we know that if it's horizontal, so if the tangent line is horizontal, that the uh, derivative needs to be equal to zero. So if it's horizontal, that means that negative 3x over 2y has to equal zero. The only way that's going to occur because this is a fraction is when the numerator is going to be equal to zero. So this is going to be cases where negative 3x is equal to zero, and if we divide by negative 3, that's only when x is equal to zero. But since they want the, uh, the equations of those tangent lines, right? they want to know the tangent lines themselves, not just the x value where it occurs, we need to find what y that that occurs at. And so uh, to wrap this problem up, now that we know that the, it's going to occur when x equals 0, where is that? Well, we do 3 times our x, which is 0 squared, plus 2y squared is equal to 16. So 2y squared is equal to 16, which means that y squared is equal to 8. And then we take the square root of both sides, so y is equal to plus or minus the square root of 8, or plus or minus 2 squared of 2, if we simplify that square root. Um, so the equations of those tangent lines, it would be either y equals positive 2 squared of 2, or y equals negative 2 squared of 2 would be the equations of those horizontal tangent lines for problem number four. Okay, what about for vertical tangent lines? Well, 
Luckily for us, we have the exact same equation again, so I won't do all of that work again. We already know from, from the last problem we just did that dy dx is gonna be negative three x over two y. Now, what we said before is we know that vertical tangent lines occur when the derivative is undefined, or if there's a vertical tangent line, we know the derivative is going to be undefined. So we need to think about what would make this undefined. Well, we know that it's gonna be undefined when the denominator equals zero. So when 2y is equal to 0 or when y is equal to 0. So that's going to be places where we know that this is going to have vertical tangent lines. Again, similar to the last problem, if we want to know the equations themselves, it's not enough to just know what the y value is. We need to know, uh, you know what, what the actual tangent lines are. Um, and so if we do that, we're going to plug that 0 back into our original function. So 3x squared plus 2 times 0 squared is equal to 16. So 3x squared is equal to 16. x squared is 16 over 3, which means that x is equal to plus or minus the square root of 16 over 3 or plus or minus four over the square root of three. And again, I don't really like leaving square roots in the denominator. So that's going to be plus or minus four root three over three. So what are our two equations? Y equals positive four root three over three or negative four root three over three. That would be our two equations for our vertical tangent lines on that graph that we've got here uh, for this. But that is it for our uh, notes for today. We've got some good practice. If you go along, all the way down is our test prep where we see some AP style problems. Try those out, check your answers, and as usual, you know, come to class with any questions that you've got. Have a great rest of your day and good luck on your mastery check.